Welcome to the CSSN channel. Our topic for today is how a coronavirus vaccine would work. This is a very interesting subject and we are going to explore it together. My name is Abuzar Habibinia. I have an MD degree and I'm the director of the Canadian Academy of Exponership. So subscribe to the CSSN channel on YouTube to enjoy the information that we share on a regular basis about medicine, weight loss, fitness, and exposure. Okay, today we are going to discuss how a coronavirus vaccine would work. While the corona pandemic is still raging on, a massive worldwide hunt to find a cure or a reasonable treatment to contain it is underway. And definitely one of the options is to make a vaccine for it. Currently, there are about 100 pharma companies around the globe that they are trying to make a coronavirus vaccine. Today, we are going to dig into science to see what it says about that, how a coronavirus vaccine would work, how successful a coronavirus vaccine would be, and what kind of challenges a coronavirus vaccine would face with. This presentation is going to be in four parts. In part one, we talk about enveloped viruses versus naked viruses. In part two, we talk about different types of immunity in the body. And in part three, we talk briefly about adjuvants in vaccines. And in part four, we discuss how a coronavirus vaccine would work. You will understand part four much better and it will make more sense to you if you understand the first three parts. Let's go with part one. Let's see what envelope and naked viruses are. In medicine, viruses are classified according to a number of factors, including their structure, the nature of their genome, their replication strategy and the disease they cause. The classification I'm going to show you now is based on their structure. So we have two groups of viruses, naked viruses and enveloped viruses. In enveloped viruses at the center, we have their genetic structure and we call them genome. And genome is uh, surrounded by a, a layer of protein and we call them protein capsid. And then the protein capsid and genome is covered by a lipid by layer. In fact, it is the lipid by layer that is going to act as an envelope to protect the genome and the protein capsid. But in naked viruses, we have genome at the center, which is basically surrounded by a layer of protein capsid. In naked viruses, because they don't have the lipid by layer around them, that's why this group is called naked viruses. And here are some examples for you. I have put them already on the board for you. Coronavirus is here. Coronavirus is an enveloped virus. Mump, measles, rubella, influenza virus, herpes virus, hepatitis B, C, and D, Ebola virus, HIV, and rabies. They are enveloped uh, viruses. Examples for naked viruses. Rhinovirus. Rhinovirus is the most common cause of common cold. Rotavirus. Rotavirus is the most common cause of diarrhea in infants and uh, young children. Hepatitis A and E. Poliovirus. Papillomavirus. Norvac virus. Norvac virus is the uh, main reason for the outbreak of diarrhea in daycare centers and adenovirus okay now you know what enveloped viruses and what naked viruses are these two groups of viruses they have two major differences here's the first one in terms of sensitivity to alcohol detergents and ether now you know from the outbreak going on now uh, enveloped viruses they are sensitive to alcohol detergents and ether 
Why? Because alcohol and detergents, they are going to dissolve the lipid by layer around them. So when you use alcohol or other detergents or you wash your hands with soap, they are going to dissolve this uh, protecting lipid by layer. And when this lipid by layer is gone, the genome and protein capsule, they cannot do pretty much anything. But this viruses, naked viruses, because they don't have the lipid bilayer on them, they are not sensitive to alcohol, detergents, or ether. This is why when there is outbreak of diarrhea in daycare center, they are not going to go to spray around everywhere with alcohol. They are not going to suggest to wash your hands with uh, soap or alcohol because they don't have the protecting a lipid bilayer on them. And the second difference is this, in terms of causing persistent infections, naked viruses cannot, cannot cause persistent infections, negative. But enveloped viruses, they are able to cause persistent infections. And from the outbreak is going on now, you know what exactly I mean. Another difference between naked uh, viruses and enveloped viruses is this. Most vaccine that they make for enveloped viruses, they contain live viruses. But of course, there are definitely some exceptions. And uh, killed vaccines, I mean the vaccines that they contain uh, killed viruses would be definitely enough uh, for naked viruses. But as I said, we have definitely some exceptions. For example, adenovirus is a naked virus, but the vaccine for adenovirus contains actually live virus. Hepatitis B, hepatitis B is, a, is an enveloped virus, but the vaccine for hepatitis B does not contain live virus. Now you know the differences uh, between naked viruses and enveloped viruses. Let's go with part two. We have two types of immunity, active immunity and passive immunity. The purpose of vaccination is to induce active immunity. So active immunity, sometimes it is called adaptive immunity. So if you hear the term adaptive immunity, it is the same. Active immunity has two functioning arms, and in medicine we call them humoral immunity and cell-mediated immunity. In humoral immunity, the body is going to produce lots of antibodies to protect you. In fact, in humoral immunity, lymphocytes type B and also some other cells that we call them plasma cells, they're going to produce uh, lots of antibodies to protect you against a specific microbe. But in cell-mediated immunity, three groups of white blood cells, they're gonna go on a very high alert. Tissue macrophages, lymphocytes type T, and natural killer cells. In humoral immunity, those antibodies that are produced by lymphocytes B and plasma cells, they are a sort of arrows or missiles of the immune system because sometimes they need to travel great distances to reach their targets. But in cell-mediated immunity, we are going to have hand-to-hand -hand combat. In cell-mediated immunity, those white blood cells that they have been on a higher alert already, they're going to en encounter uh, microbes one-on-one -on -one to destroy them. This is why Humoral immunity is going to defend us against microbes outside the cells. But cell-mediated immunity is going to defend us against microbes inside the cells. And the reason that you need to know the difference between humoral immunity and cell-mediated immunity was this. Some vaccines can induce only humoral immunity, for example, flu vaccine and vaccine for hepatitis A, they can induce only humoral immunity. On the other hand, we have uh, vaccines that they can 
induce both cell-mediated immunity and uh, uh, humoral immunity. For instance, MMR vaccine. Now you know the difference between humoral immunity and cell-mediated immunity. Let's go with part three. What are adjuvants? Why do they add them to the vaccines? Adjuvants are substances that can enhance and promote immune response to immunogen. In fact, they help boost the body's response to the vaccines. I have listed in here for you the top four adjuvants that you can find in a different vaccines. Number one, aluminum hydroxide. Number two, aluminum phosphate. Number three, MF59. Actually, this is the adjuvant that you can find in flu vaccines. And number four, monophosphoryl lipid A. Sometimes people, they mix up adjuvants with preservatives and stabilizers. Definitely, they are not the same at all. Today, you'll learn that adjuvants are added to the vaccine to enhance the body's response to them. But preservatives, uh, such as thimerosal, which is a kind of mercury, they add them to the vaccine to prevent contamination. And stabilizers, such as sugars, sometimes even gelatin, they add them to the vaccines to keep them effective after being manufactured. The reason that you needed to know about adjuvants was this. Some vaccines contain adjuvants. For example, flu vaccines, they contain MF59. And some vaccines do not contain adjuvants. For example, MMR vaccine. Let's go with part four. So far, we discussed enveloped viruses versus naked viruses, cell-mediated immunity versus humoral immunity, and adjuvants in vaccines to prepare you for this part of the presentation to make you understand it much better. In medicine, there are three types of viral vaccines. I'm going to give you examples for every one of them. Then we're going to review together their differences. Okay. Those three viral vaccines in medicine are live attenuated, killed, or inactivated. So if you hear inactivated vaccine is the same thing, kill, and subunit or component. Here are some examples for vaccines that they contain live attenuated viruses. MMR vaccine, mumps, measles, rubella. A polio vaccine, subentype, rotavirus vaccine, and a smallpox vaccine. And there are a couple of more vaccines uh, in here, like vaccine for a yellow fever, varicella vaccine, and also adenovirus vaccine. They contain live attenuated viruses. Vaccines that they contain killed or inactivated viruses. Sometimes, you know, people, they ask us, how do they kill? How do they inactivate viruses to make vaccines out of them? They use in medicine uh, three techniques. Dry heat, irradiation, or chemicals such as formalin. Okay, examples for vaccines that they contain killed viruses. Rabies, influenza, the flu vaccines that people are getting on a, you know, every single year. Polio vaccine, salt type, and hepatitis A. And two famous vaccines for uh, subunit vaccines, hepatitis B and HPV vaccine. Okay, let's review together their differences. Reversion to virulence. That means having the potential to revert to its original pathogenic form, which is going to lead to sickness. Uh, for live attenuated vaccines, possible. For killed vaccines, no. 
for subunit vaccine? No. Causing infection in immunocompromised people? Yes? No? No. You see, in medicine, it is totally forbidden to give live attenuated vaccines to those people with immunodeficiency. Those people, they have weak immune systems for any reasons. For example, people with cancers. Those people, they are on chemo. Those people with autoimmune diseases. There are many people out there that they are taking uh, different kind of immunosuppressive medications. For example, corticosteroids, methotrexate. There are many of them out there. We cannot give live attenuated vaccines to those people with weak immune systems. Adjuvants. Live attenuated vaccines do not have adjuvants. Kill the vaccines, they do have. Subunit vaccines, they do have. Immunity. Live attenuated vaccines, they induce high immunity. Kill vaccines low. And for subunit vaccine, it is medium. You see, if you check medical books, they don't give you any specific number. They just go with high, low, medium. And of course, it is out of 100. When we say high, let's say it is reasonable to assume it is going to be 80% uh, or more. Low. Let's go with around 40% uh, or less. And medium is going to be somewhere around 50 to 60%. Uh, Cell-mediated immunity. Live attenuated vaccines induces good. Kill vaccines, very poor, very poor, almost none. And subunit vaccines, poor. Humoral immunity. Of course, all three uh, kind of vaccines, definitely they can provide humoral immunity. And in terms of risk of contamination, live attenuated vaccine, the risk is high. For killed vaccines, the risk is low. And for subunit vaccines, there is no risk of contamination. Now you know the differences among those three uh, kind of viral vaccines in medicine. Let's see if they make corona vaccine of any kind. What are the advantages and disadvantages? Let's say they make corona vaccine that contains live attenuated uh, virus. The only advantage is this, is going to induce high immunity. But here are the problems with corona vaccine that contains live attenuated virus. The first problem is this, the virus has the ability to revert to its original pathogenic form. Imagine there is a corona vaccine that contains live attenuated virus. And you read among the complications that it is possible that the virus, you know, is going to get activated in your body and is going to cause sickness in you. Do you really think that uh, people, they're going to take it? If we didn't have this outbreak, if people they didn't know about coronavirus, probably most people, they would take it. But with this pandemic happening, with all those information out there, if they are about to give you a corona vaccine that contains live attenuated uh, virus, you're going to imagine definitely the worst case scenario about yourself. Maybe I'm going to be one of those people that the virus is going to get activated in my body and I'm going to end up in hospital, I'm going to end up in ICU. That is the, probably the first problem. So if people discover, oh, this vaccine contains live attenuated virus and it is possible that the virus is going to reactivate it in my body, cause sickness, I don't think people, they're going to take it. And the second problem with live attenuated uh, vaccine is this. We cannot give to those people that they have weak immune system. There are millions people out there that they have weak immune system for uh, 
many reasons. And as I said, in medicine, it is totally forbidden to give live attenuated vaccines to those people with immunodeficiency. And also, we cannot give corona vaccine that contains live attenuated virus to pregnant women. And finally, there is a higher risk of contamination. So the possibility that they are going to make corona vaccine that contains live attenuated virus is very, very low, almost zero. Okay, let's go with the second one. If they make a corona vaccine that contains kill or inactivated virus, as you can see in here from this chart, that definitely there is a no risk of uh, reversion to virulence, and you can give to those people with weak immune system. The risk of contamination is low, and here is the uh, problem with kill vaccines. Immunity is low. Let's say about 40 percent. That means out of you know, 100 people, they, they're going to get vaccinated against the uh, coronavirus. It's still 60% of them, they may develop infection if they had any exposure, right? And also in here, we have only humoral immunity. Uh, Cell-mediated immunity is very poor uh, or almost zero. And definitely, coronavirus of subunit type is going to be number one. From the information that has surfaced here and there, it appears that most pharma company they are trying to make corona vaccine that contains only a subunit of the virus. Okay, let's see hey, what are the advantages and disadvantages of corona vaccine of subunit type. Well, definitely there's no risk of, as you can see, there's no risk of contamination and you can give to those people with weak immune system and is not gonna cause any uh, real infection in your body. The problem with subunit vaccine is this, it's gonna give you immunity about 50 to 60% only. You see in medicine, 50 to 60% immunity is not that bad if the virus is not mutating fast. One of the problems with this coronavirus responsible for COVID-19 is this, it is mutating fast. So, a vaccine that is going to provide about 50 to 60% immunity, and I'm guessing up to 20% of people out there, they are not willing to take it, and the virus is mutating fast. Do you really believe that corona vaccine as subunit type is the final and ultimate solution for coronavirus infections? Please keep in mind that nobody is against making corona vaccine. And I'm just elaborating, putting the scientific pieces together just to show people how it will work when it is out to use. Based on the information that we discussed today, and according to the data that we have up to this moment, science doesn't support the notion that vaccination can be the final and ultimate solution for coronavirus infections. Neither can it prevent from happening in the future. However, one of the beauties of science is this, it is ever-changing. It is changing constantly. Maybe within the next few weeks or month, they're going to discover something that is going to change the whole story. And of course, vaccination can provide some protection to vulnerable groups of people. Vaccination can only decrease the incidence rate of the infection, and it cannot eliminate it for 100%. And but let's keep in mind something very important at the end. Vaccination doesn't mean a good immune system at all. It simply means that you have some protection against certain microbes. But a well-functioning immune system, this is what I always call, a well-functioning immune system can protect you against many microbes out there. And a well-functioning immune system depends on six factors. Factor number one, your eating habits. 
nutrition. The body needs hundreds of nutrients. Are you getting the right nutrients with the right amounts? Factor number two, your sleeping habits. Factor number three, your stress level. Factor number four, your physical activity level. Are you exercising regularly? Factor number five, the medical conditions that some people they may have. And factor number six, medications that many people they take. I really hope that you learn something interesting today because we make science easy to understand. Now you know. If you don't want to miss the video that we post on a regular basis on CSSN channel, you can subscribe to our channel. To support us, you can share, like, or comment on this video. Until next time, stay safe, stay corrected.